Good evening. 38 years after the end of World War II, the United States formally admitted today that its agents helped alleged Nazi war criminal Klaus Barbie escape prosecution. Barbie was the wartime head of the Gestapo in the French city of Lyon and was wanted by the French on charges of mass murder and other crimes. In a report of more than 200 pages released today, the Justice Department said officers of the U.S. Army Counterintelligence Corps engaged in obstruction of justice by concealing Barbie from U.S. civilian authorities. It called the actions incomprehensible and shameful. The report said the Intelligence Corps recruited Barbie as a spy against the Soviets, unaware that he was wanted as a war criminal, but later helped him to escape to South America. The Reagan administration confirmed late today that it has apologized to the French government. Tonight, the Barbie case, with the man who conducted the Justice Department investigation, the man who ran a counterintelligence unit in Germany when Barbie was in U.S. control, and an American Jewish leader unsatisfied by the government's investigation. Jim? Robin, there are both general and specific charges against Klaus Barbie, the so-called Butcher of Lyon. The sweeping one is that he had a direct hand in the deaths of more than 4,000 French Jews and members of the French Resistance. And that is head of the Gestapo in Lyon, France from 1942 to 44. He sent 7,000 more persons, mostly Jews, to concentration camps. The specifics include locking 100 teenagers in their school and then burning and dynamiting it, personally torturing prisoners, some to death, with kicks, beatings, and ice water, ordering hundreds of Jews onto trains and then refusing them food or water, thus intentionally killing them all. In the confusion after the war, Barbie escaped France to Germany, where according to today's Justice Department report, he worked for American intelligence, providing information on the Soviet Union and on communists in Germany. In 1951, with the heat on from France to find Barbie and prosecute him for his Lyon crimes, U.S. agents helped him escape through Austria to Genoa, Italy, then on a ship to South America. For the next 31 years, he lived mostly in Bolivia as Klaus Altman, a businessman. He was found and identified by the French and others 12 years ago, but it wasn't until last year that a new democratic government in Bolivia arrested him and expelled him to France, where now, 69 years old, he awaits trial for what he is accused of doing in Lyon 40 years ago. The Justice Department investigation of U.S. involvement in the Barbie affair began last March under the direction of Alan Ryan, Jr., director of the Justice Department's Office of Special Investigations, who issued today's report. Mr. Ryan, let's go through your basic con conclusions first. And you believe that the use of Barbie by U.S. intelligence officers as an agent right after the war was justified or at least defensible and understandable, I correct? think it w I think it was defensible, and I want to correct something that was uh, uh, Robin said a few minutes ago. I did not call that incomprehensible and shameful. I said some people would find it incomprehensible and shameful. Others would find it a very necessary uh, response to the forces that were uh, at work in Germany after the war. My own conclusion is that uh, uh, Army officers in 1947, when Barbie was recruited, were not aware uh, that he was wanted uh, by the French on war crimes charges. They were not aware of the charges that were listed uh, a moment ago. And uh, I found that, uh, uh, based on that, that their decision to, to uh, employ him and rely on him uh, was at least defensible, even if it was not the only defensible choice that was available. All right, let's move to the second stage. when. There was information about when information did come to light from the French as to what the charges were against Barbie, and your investigation revealed that U.S. officers did know that and did shield him from the French, correct? Yes. Now, what is your conclusion about that? Well, my conclusion was that, that uh, when the uh, State Department in Germany, the High Commission for Germany, HICOC, uh, received a re the request from the French government for the extradition of Klaus Barbie, it asked the army forces in Europe if... Uh, this was what, about 19... This is 1950 uh, uh, at this point. 1950. Okay. <clears throat> uh, the State Department did not know the name Klaus Barbie. They asked the army. The army said, uh, we uh, used to employ him, but we don't anymore, and we don't know where he is. And at the time, uh, that information was simply false because the army was employing him uh, and continued to employ him until February of 1951. Now, how... What would be your conclusion there? My, con my conclusion there is that the uh, officers who, who uh, uh, represented that to HICOG uh, 
uh, knowing it to be false, and knowing that High Cog was seeking to uh, rule on the extradition request, committed an obstruction of justice under United States law. All right, now we move to the third stage, and that was helping Barbie get out of Europe and into South America. What's your conclusion there? Well, my conclusion there is that that is uh, a continuation of the obstruction of justice. It's the culmination of, of the process that was begun when, when the uh, army uh, shielded him. Uh, by removing him to South America, uh, they ensured that the French uh, would not uh, uh, be able to apprehend him and put him on trial. And so uh, it's, it's certainly a more dramatic episode, but it's, it's really uh, the, the, the culmination of the uh, obstruction of, of justice in this case. You talked, of course, to many of the people who were involved in that. What, was the reas what reasons did they give for having done this? Well, uh, I want to say, first of all, that in fairness to the uh, other guest tonight, uh, Mr. Kolb, uh, who was in the Army at that time, uh, he would not be uh, implicated in the obstruction of justice because he was down in... Uh, Augsburg working with Barbie and the representations to the State Department were made by the headquarters staff in, in Stuttgart. And those people, uh, I think the, the uh, feeling was really more of insensitivity than anything else. Uh, their, their feeling was that to turn Barbie over to the State Department and thus to the French would compromise uh, intelligence operations in Germany, uh, would turn over a very sensitive uh, resource, namely Klaus Barbie, to the French and that uh, they felt that that would uh, jeopardize what they were doing in Germany. And I don't think there was really any thought given to uh, the fact that uh, by misrepresenting the truth to the State Department, they were, uh, in fact, committing uh, an obstruction of justice. Did you find any evidence that any of the officers in the Army Intelligence Corps were involved in this series of things from 1950 on, did so specifically to protect a Nazi war criminal from being found and prosecuted? No, I, they, were, they were seeking to protect an American intelligence uh, uh, informant. Uh, when, when Barbie was recruited in 1947, the, French, uh, the uh, Army uh, had no knowledge of the French charges, and when those charges uh, were, were made known to them in 1950, their response was to uh, protect this very valuable uh, asset, if you will, and protect their own operations. There was certainly no sympathy for uh, Nazi war crimes or Nazism. Do you feel that any of the people involved in any of this chain of events should now be publicly prosecuted, condemned, otherwise censured? Uh, prosecution is not possible because the statute of limitations has expired. The decision, as I said in the report, to recruit and use Barbie in 1947, I think is a defensible one. I don't think it was cynical. I don't think it was corrupt. I think uh, there's a very strong argument that can be made on the other side that we ought to have had nothing to do with the Gestapo uh, in any way, shape, or form. But uh, there's a strong argument that we were facing a new adversary and that we needed the resources uh, that were available. Uh, and I. I I think that uh, it would be unfair now to, to vilify those officers for that decision, even though you or I or anyone else might have made the opposite Difference. decision had we been there. We were not there. Uh, I do not think uh, one can defend the uh, action that uh, uh, amounted to obstructing justice. I think that the Army uh, had an obligation to be truthful to the State Department. I think that uh, although their concerns were, were strong ones, uh, it does not excuse the fact that they uh, lied to the State Department and uh, uh, interfered with the, with the administration of the law. Thank you. Robin? Now to an officer who was directly involved in the Barbie matter. Eugene Kolb was Chief of Operations for the U.S. Army Counterintelligence Corps in the Augsburg region of Germany from early 1949 to late 1950. Mr. Kolb is now retired and lives in Lynn, Maine. He joins us tonight from public station WMEG in Portland. And the picture, so you don't need to adjust your set, is in black and white. Mr. Kolb, uh, what was exactly your connection with Barbie? Well, as chief of operations in the Augsburg region, I supervised, directed, and controlled uh, those American agents who in turn controlled people such as Barbie, German agents, as well as non-American other non-American personnel. Did, did, did you meet him yourself? I met him myself oh, on several occasions. Why was he valuable to U.S. intelligence? Uh, again, I think Mr. Ryan pointed out some of this, that uh, this was the height of the Cold War, and around 1947, 1948, we were assigned brand new and very difficult targets to penetrate 
operations to pursue. And the kind of American personnel that we had at that time were, for the most part, with some exceptions, not very well qualified for this kind of operation. You desperately needed non-American personnel with some experience, with uh, background, with the skills required, and who appeared at the time to us to be relatively clean, shall we say, in terms of their political background. Were you, uh, were you involved in Barbie's escape to South America? No, I was not. That was after my time. That was after your time. D you knew of it and approved of it, did you? Uh, I knew of it, and uh, uh, looking back, uh, well, as Mr. Ryan put it neatly, I think legally it was probably indefensible. From our standpoint, uh, I think it was necessary, and that's for the, not so much to protect an asset, but far more that Barbie, during his tenure, had done a very effective job of recruiting some informants for us from within the German Communist Party, as well as some other neo-Nazi right-wing groups. And uh, we were fairly certain, knowing the character of the French intelligence and security services at that time, and let me stress, at that time, uh, that French intelligence had been fairly, pen fairly well penetrated by Communist Party members and Soviet officials, and we were very, very fearful that their first uh, priority as far as the interrogation of Bobby was concerned would be to interrogate him about our operations, about the sources he had recruited, and that would have blown these operations, blown these sources, and indeed, in the, in the context of the late 40s, probably the life of these sources, because it was notorious that some people simply disappeared uh, to the other side of the Iron Curtain, so to speak. That was our real concern. Looking and that, I'm sure, was the real concern of those people who effected his, shall we say, escape to South America. How high up did that go, that kind of decision-making? Are you aware? Uh, at the, um, as far as the escape is concerned, uh, I am quite certain it must have gone higher than our own headquarters. Certainly our headquarters in Stuttgart at the time, but I'm certain the way things were run at that time, it must have gone higher. At the very least, I would think the European command, the military command. And I would not be surprised if it had gone even to civilian officials over there. Looking back on it, it's more than 30 years now. How do you feel about it now? <laughs> uh, a sense of that it's difficult to understand it in the context of 1983. The bind that we were in, in terms of the intelligence missions that we were assigned, the difficulty of covering those intelligence missions, the fact, the hard fact, that at that time there were no charges of war crimes or anything of the sort levied against Barbie, and the fact that uh, we, what we knew about French intelligence, all of that makes me feel, uh, well, certainly not very confident that we made the right decision, uh, but a little uneasy certainly today at the very least. But it's still in the context of the time, these, uh, that was the decision. Well, thank you. We'll come back. The Justice Department report does not satisfy a number of American Jewish leaders. One of them is Julius Berman, chairman of the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations. Mr. Berman is also an attorney in a New York law firm. Mr. Berman, what's your overall reaction to the report? Well, my reaction essentially is that I'm pleased with the fact that there is a report. By that I mean that the, the United States has the gumption to sit down in light of these charges and investigate and, and disclose to the world what the facts were. Uh, however, I do have substantial problems with the conclusions in the report. What are your problems? Well, basically, as I see it, I think, uh, and I think you touched on it, Robin, in one of your questions to Mr. Kolb, uh, the decision-making process. Uh, you have the impression from everything I've heard that uh, within the counterintelligence corps, which essentially at that point in time was one issue oriented to get counterintelligence, they were making decisions that involve a panoply of issues. Uh, how important is the, the uh, intelligence operation that they're, they're looking for? Uh, how sure are they that uh, uh, Mr. Barbie will get it? Are there any alternatives? What happens if disclosed to our relationship with, uh, with our allies, such as France? And of course, uh, in, in the fight for the hearts and minds of the people throughout the world, what happens when it's disclosed as is now evident? Uh, and, um, 
Uh, therefore, I, I do believe that uh, uh, the decision-making process was clearly at fault, and someone who has such issues uh, on their desk should be the one that ultimately makes that kind of decision. After all is said and done, I still haven't heard how terribly important it was to get the information we were talking about, and more important, whether Klaus Barbie was the only one they could get it from. But you're talking about decisions made in the past. What is your problem with the report about those decisions? Well, the suggestion in the conclusion was that, you know, uh, that is 30 years ago, it's maybe a little hindsight. You can say that about uh, what happened uh, 40 years ago also. Uh, I believe that the report while it reflects and discloses that defect, does not suggest in its conclusion that there is such a defect. Uh, and, the, and the ultimate irony is uh, the, the factual conclusion that our people did not know who Barbie was. Uh, there's, you know, you mentioned I'm a lawyer. We know there's, uh, there's knowledge and there's reckless di disregard of, of the truth. Uh, to suggest You're that saying they did know or somebody I'm knew. saying that if they didn't know, they didn't want to know. And that's virtually as bad. Do you think the inquiry should stop here or that a further step should be taken? I believe uh, uh, that, uh, of course, we've overlooked what to me is a very, very moral issue, is that, that whether we can uh, use such people for whatever purposes, and then, of course, you get involved with alternatives. Uh, and uh, in that context, uh, the suggestion, including by Mr. Ryan this evening, uh, that if uh, they had to do it over again, he could just as well see uh, that it might be doable. Uh, I think reflects a problem we have in our own uh, uh, analysis of the right and wrong. Uh, with respect to uh, the report itself, I don't think it should be put to bed. I think the conclusions have to be uh, developed, discussed, debated, and the government eventually has to make an ultimate decision as to what types of policies they will use in the future. And just like with Watergate, I believe, despite the fact there's no criminal charges involved, as Mr. Ryan says, that uh, we still have to flush out the facts to, to disclose so that we will learn for the future. You don't think enough of the facts have come out yet, is that it? Yes. Thank you. Jim? Are there more facts to, there to are, come out, Mr. Ryan? There are no more facts to come out about Klaus Barbie. Now, <clears throat> there is uh, much that can be said, and I think Mr. Berman is right, that these issues ought to be debated and, and discussed and uh, so forth, but I, there are no more facts about Klaus Barbie in the United States government. I, I made sure of that in my report. Were you and, given unlimited access to... Yes. Everything in the government, everything yes. the government has. Yes, we made it quite clear that this was a Department of Justice investigation. It was not uh, Alan Ryan investigating. It was the Department of Justice. We expected to receive cooperation. We did receive it. So when you sat down to draw your conclusions, you felt you had all the information that was it was able yes. to get. Yes. All right. What about Mr. Berman's basic point about who made this decision and the decision-making process? Can you take us through? Can you answer that question? Who ultimately decided it was all right to help? Barbie get out of the country and the decision before that to uh, obstruct justice, to use your term? Well, there were, there were so many decisions made along the way. The decision, the first decision in 1947 to recruit him and to use him as an informant, uh, with all respect to Mr. Berman, he's simply not uh, correct that uh, th this amounted to a reckless disregard of what was known. These facts were not known uh, beyond the French government. The French had not, the French had, had investigated uh, Lyon uh, after the war but their files, their charges, and so forth were not uh, made available to the Americans. Uh, the personnel files and the information that was available to the Americans indicated that Barbie was a counterintelligence officer. Now, that situation later changed, but in 1947, that was the state of knowledge. Uh, and as I say, those decisions were... Uh, sure. Well, let's get into the, to the serious ones about when once, <coughs> once uh, the United States agents or the U.S. agents did know about what the French charges were, and then the decision to obstruct justice, and then the decision to help the man go to South. Who actually made that decision? They were made at uh, what I would call normal operating levels of the counterintelligence corps in Germany. That is, uh, the, the commanding officer of the counterintelligence corps and his staff, the liaison with the higher command, which was the European command that Mr. Kolb mentioned, and similar units in, in Austria. It didn't come back to Washington, <clears throat> didn't come to high civilian authority? Not as far as we know, no. There are, there are the records on that particular episode are not quite complete, but I, I am fairly confident in saying that it was done uh, at a normal operating level. It was considered a uh, disposal of, a, of an intelligence uh, resource, and it was handled as any other disposal would be. And I think that is part of the problem, that there was an insensitivity and, a, and an, uh, 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 the fact that, that uh, an American agency 
was looking for this man uh, was was simply not considered uh, uh, as I think it should have been. So the fact that it was made at normal operating levels is perhaps uh, part of the problem, as Mr. Berman points out. Yeah, Mr. Cole, would you agree with that? That that was not the place uh, at the operating level is not the place where this decision should have been made. If that is really the case, I'm. I'm still not convinced of it, and uh, as Mr. Ryan has indicated, the files are rather incomplete at that point. Why I don't you... really know what went on between our headquarters and higher levels, because I only dealt with headquarters. But the impression I got was that there was a good deal of uh, hanky-panky at higher levels, and I doubt... What do you mean by... Excuse me. What do you mean by that, sir? Covering up. That some mm -hmm. people today are not willing to admit the role that they played in the Barbie case, and that's even true of our own CIC people, regrettably. Uh, well, I'm wait a minute, let's ask Mr. Ryan. You talked to him. Did you have the feeling that some uh, folks just, were there anybody, was there anybody who either would not talk to you, or when they did talk to you, you had either a feeling, either in your bones or based on the record, that they weren't just, they weren't leveling with you? There, there was nobody who refused to talk to us. Uh, many of the people involved, of course, are dead. Uh, Everyone agreed to talk to us. I think, uh, by and large, most of them were, were fairly uh, candid. But we are talking about events that happened 35 uh, or sure. more years ago, and I think memories uh, uh, are not, uh, not was there the a, best indicator here. Was there a paper As, trail? Yes. Was there's, this a, thing there's, a very, there's a very, very strong paper trail, and, and the report relies almost entirely on the paper trail. Mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to the memories and the recollection of witnesses after 35 years. Mr. Cobb? Yes. Well, you, you're what Mr. Ryan says, there's a paper trail. And he yes, followed it as far as he could go. But uh, let me put it this way. I know that a good deal of the discussions that took place between myself at the Augsburg level at, and headquarters, and a good deal of the discussions that took place between headquarters and some higher level, which I don't know about, were not always committed to paper. A lot of it was telephone conversations. Mm. Mr. Berman, what do you say in response to Mr. Ryan's answer to your concern about the, what the U.S. agents knew about Klaus Barbie when they first hired him on in 1947? Uh, I think Mr. Cole hit it on the head. First of all, uh, the paper trail is the easiest thing to detect and it's the easiest thing to, uh, to use as a cover-up. And Mr. Colby, Mr. Cole suggested that there may be much more to it that uh, really was not put on paper and intentionally. But, what, I, but uh, what is critical, when I say a reckless disregard of the truth, I do not mean they knew and they looked the other way. I mean it's difficult for me to believe that the United States Army intelligence, even in the 1940s, if they're going to hire somebody or retain somebody, make an employee of somebody, can't push the appropriate buttons and ascertain the information. Go to the French, go to the Germans, find out, rather than finding out later that... Uh, uh, that they're dealing with somebody such as Barbie and then two years later being stuck with them because they're going to be embarrassed to the world and therefore uh, spirit them out to Bolivia. I'll see. Robin? Mr. Ryan, let's come closer to the present time. Does your report not also indicate that as late as the middle 60s, the U.S. Army Counterintelligence Corps wanted to use Barbie again, knowing he was in South America, but was talked out of it by the CIA? Uh, Yes, the Army considered the possibility. They uh, uh, discussed it with the CIA. The CIA said it would not be uh, uh, a very good step, and the Army simply withdrew its, uh, its, its consideration. I don't think it ever got to the point where they formally requested him. Certainly they never contacted him, but, but that, the, thought, that thought did surface in the But the, the thought surfaced long after it was known what the charges against Barbie were and who he was. Yes. Yes. What is your reaction to that, Mr. Well, I think, uh, Robin, I think you touched on something, because with all the discussion, both in the report and this evening, I am not really clear whether there would have been any difference had they known everything that uh, they know now. From everything I've heard as to the rationale, why they used them, why they needed them, this, that, and the other thing, I haven't heard anything that to suggest that if they knew it, they wouldn't have done it, and it would have been wrong if they did do it. Uh, what is your uh, comment on that, Mr. Kolb? Again, Mr. Berman forgets the context of the late 1940s. Uh, as far, I believe that the French authorities themselves did not know about these so-called atrocities, war crimes, etc. What the French wanted him for, to my understanding, was interrogation uh, <coughs> for the purpose of identifying and possibly serving as a witness against French collaborators and French traitors nothing to do whatsoever with war crimes. 
and he asks us to investigate. We should have investigated these people. Well, we certainly did to our best of our ability. But to do that and to go across borders in 1947, 48, 49, 50 was an utterly impossible task. Mr. Ryan, the point Mr. Berman raised uh, a little earlier, that what this shows is that some studies should be done or something should be looked into in the decision-making process in U.S. intelligence and the kinds of things it feels permitted to do. Does your study of this case suggest to you that there should be more rigorous, uh, a more rigorous inquiry in that direction if as late as the middle 60s this sort of thing was being considered again? Well, I think you have to uh, remember, too, that the... Uh, our, our notions about the intelligence community and the proper role of intelligence gathering in American government have undergone tremendous uh, change in the last 10 years, and I think generally change for the better. The, there's, there's much more uh, uh, recognition of the fact that uh, intelligence agencies ought to be accountable for their actions, that, that uh, it is not possible to justify everything imaginable under the cloak of intelligence. I think what we're looking at here in the Barbie situation uh, is is a uh, uh, perhaps a, a moment in time, if you will. I'm not at uh, all sure that this the is same course would have been followed, uh, at least uh, uh, in in 1983. Our time is up. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Kolb, for joining us in Portland, Maine. Uh, Mr. Ryan in Washington, Mr. Bremen in New York. Good night, Jim. Good night, Robert. That's all for tonight. We will be back tomorrow night. I'm Robert McNeil. Good night. <laughs>